Welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to today's uh, science, uh, Quapi Science Seminar. Uh, my name is Lee Hickey and facilitator for today. Uh, today we're going to hear a seminar from Dr. Samir Alamad and at the end we're going to have a Q&A session. So if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, write them in the Q&A box and we'll try to address some of those at the end. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alamad. Uh, almost six years ago, uh, Samir joined my lab to take on a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. At that time, he had very little knowledge about plant breeding and genetics, I have to say. Uh, Samir grew up in Syria, and I know he, he had dreamed of working for Ikada to develop better crops for farmers as a kid. Of course, Ikada was originally based in Syria prior to the war, but now uh, they are based in Morocco. Samir gained a highly competitive Monsanto uh, Beach Borlaug scholarship funded by Monsanto to do a PhD at UQ, and he actually ended up collaborating with the Durham breeder at Ikada through his project. So uh, it's funny how things turn out in life. Samir is now a real rising star in the field of Durham breeding and genetics, uh, having obtained a number of awards, invitations to speak at key meetings, and has a growing list of publications. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Samir. Uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Yeah, thank you for uh, this kind of introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all for um, making the time uh, and joining in. So today's seminar is Design of Roots for Australian Wheat. Here is the Australian uh, wheat production in, in the last 30 years. Um, and as we can see, um, in this uh, bar, bar plots are referring the, the area sown to wheat and uh, this line, the blue line is the production. And if we look closely to this line, we can see when the drought was occurring um, in the last 30 years. Um, in particular, in 2018 and 19, it has been a really dry, um, dry year for um, uh, Queensland and New South Wales. And um, also drought occurred in, uh, in um, Europe in this, uh, in this years. And this is a very nice um, um, aerial footage uh, of, uh, of one of the farmers field, field and you can see uh, how much impact um, um, that was. And this picture was taken in uh, late September. Plant breeders have done a great job delivering our modern, uh, modern days varieties and cultivars, but so far, uh, they have focused uh, on only above ground traits. And starting from the green revolution until now, plant breeders have improved harvest index by selecting for shorter pl plants and high yield. But when we look at the harvest index, we can see that uh, only above ground traits are included in the equation. But what about roots? We know roots are really important for taking in um, uh, uh, moisture and, uh, and uh, fertilizers, but, but really they, they're not included and they are 30% or more of the, um, uh, of, of the whole plant biomass. So why um, do uh, uh, weed breeding uh, programs have struggled to incorporate and select for these important traits? Well, first of all, um, Phenotyping root system architecture is really difficult and um, laborious and requires a reliable method uh, when it comes to um, high repeatabilities. Um, in, in the glass house, it could require really expensive infrastructure um, for, uh, for phenotyping a large number of plants in the glass house. And uh, also uh, in the field, it could be really um, uh, difficult traits to measure. In wheat, we don't have a good understanding of the genetics controlling root system architecture, um, but um, 
there has been some really nice work done in uh, in in some other crops like uh, like rice. Um, I really like this example um, because it's um, it's a model highlighting um, the potential uh, what, what we could do um, and um, uh, for for bread wheat and this work has been done for rice and so um, what what they did um, they cloned this gene DRO1 gene uh, which is responsible. Uh, for higher root branching uh, in the, and higher root um, numbers at depth, and um, and this was really correlated with um, with high yield um, in, in in the drought conditions. In optimum field conditions of plants, um, uh, when uh, when uh, plants are grown in in really wet wet and in good in rare uh, in season rain, if a, a, it, it is really uh, not a good decision for plant to invest in root system architecture um, because having more superficial and leaner roots at the top could be advantageous for uh, capturing all these um, nutrients in the in the upper layer of the soil. Um, and um, there, there could be a big penalty uh, on having more roots um, at depth. But when, um, when, when the drought hits really hard towards the end of the season, Having higher root numbers and more roots at depth could be really advantageous and, re and advantageous and rewarding um, for yield under these uh, environments. So, in the last five, um, uh, five or six years that I've been working as a research in the re doing research here at GQ, uh, we wanted to answer some really important questions. So, first question was. Um, can we identify genetic regions associated with root system architecture? To do that, we wanted to create our populations um, and uh, we teamed up with uh, Durham breeders uh, in Morocco, Dr. Filippo Vazzi, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, here in Australia, um, Professor Jason Abel. Um, and uh, well, we set about creating populations, combining the genetics of Icarda lines and Icarda lines were bred for a long period of time for their drought adaptive uh, attributes. And um, um, uh, Australian cultivars are very well known for their quality parameters. So what, what we wanted to do was to combine these two uh, distinct genetic pools and perhaps study the root, root system architecture uh, in these populations and other drought adaptive traits. So just to give you an idea of how we created these NAM populations, we crossed a number of Icarda lines uh, to uh, two um, uh, Australian cultivars, Janderoy and DBA Aurora. And we did six generations of selfing, selfing uh, using a sing, single seed descent um, method. And uh, to do that really fast, we used uh, speed breeding where we extend plants to extend, uh, where, where we expose uh, plants to extended photo periods and, um, and controlled temperatures. And after getting to these really nice homozygote lines, we genotyped them um, for using that SIG marker uh, uh, platform. Then what we did, uh, we, we looked at the roots and um, did root phenotyping using the clearpot method. Uh, we looked at the seminal root system architecture and uh, did, uh, uh, did some work, um, shovelomics, uh, on a subset of lines to correlate it with the seminal roots. And when we uh, did the correlation, we found a reasonably good correlation uh, between the nodal roots and seminal root system architecture. So well, what we wanted to do after that, we wanted to use um, the clearpot method for phenotyping and selecting for our plants. Using phenotypic data um, uh, for uh, the subset of NAM, uh, just under 400 uh, Durham NAM lines, and uh, using really uh, good genetic information, so high quality uh, DARSIC markers, we were able to identify this um, major gene on, on 6A chromosome uh, for Durham wheat. And when we looked at these uh, correlated markers, um, the way we, 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 they were really in high LD, uh, which means um, the, the likelihood of them uh, co-inheriting is really high. So we use those markers to construct this haplotype network. And we found that the majority of, uh, of those lines um, 
um, we're, we're falling down to two major haplotypes, HAP1 and HAP2. One of the other traits that we wanted to look at uh, was um, uh, brute biomass. And um, uh, what, we, what we did, we used this nice uh, sem semi-hydroponic system um, well, with uh, uh, planting uh, with, in, in pots filled with sand. Uh, and this really makes it easy to wash these roots later on, um, maybe six and seven weeks after uh, sowing. Uh, and uh, quantify the, the genetic, uh, um, have a better understanding of um, uh, their phenotypes. In bread wheat, uh, we were uh, lucky enough to, to find a, a gene, a major gene controlling uh, root biomass. Um, and uh, this was part of uh, Kai's work. Um, he found this root biomass controlling. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we, uh, he found this um, um, QTL that controls root biomass uh, on 5B, and um, and this this QTL is this allele is actually a rare and um, not not common in the elite germoplasm, and so uh, it, it could be a really useful tool to use in breeding um, uh, programs. So the question is, can we develop breeder-friendly markers for, uh, for selection and breeding? Now that we found uh, three QTLs, uh, well, one, uh, one in uh, bread wheat, uh, controlling uh, high root biomass, and uh, two in durum wheat. Uh, one is for root, root angle, and the other one is for uh, root biomass. Well, to do that, we teamed up with um, Broad's Northern uh, team in Gießen, Germany. Uh, and um, in particular, MANA has been uh, playing a pivotal role uh, in uh, validating and uh, developing of, the, uh, of these cast markers. So based on the SNPs that we identified for these uh, three, three QTLs, uh, MANA used their sequences and optimized the conditions in PCR um, to, to better, um, uh, to trying to develop a log-specific cast marker uh, for, for the uh, polyploid gen genomes. For those who don't know, um, uh, bread wheat and uh, durum wheat. Uh, durum wheat is a tetraploid, and uh, and bread wheat is a hexaploid. So it really could be tricky to find th these um, uh, locus specific cast markers. And uh, Manar has published uh, recently a paper that details um, the uh, and, and he guides um, uh, guides the process. So for those who are interested, that they could have a look at this paper. Now that we, uh, we understand the genetics of root system architecture traits and uh, the, the developed user-friendly markers linked to some of those key genes controlling root system architecture in uh, durum and bread wheat, now can we estimate the value of root traits um, uh, to support yield? So, we, uh, so to, to investigate the, the value and the link between root traits and yield, we tested a subset of 20, 200 uh, NAM lines in really diverse environments. Some of those environments were high yielding. Uh, so uh, South Australia, um, lots of in-season in rainfalls uh, in Roseworthy and also in Morocco in Marshwish Station uh, and um, in, uh, in Queensland in Tazari and, uh, and Warwick uh, where we had really severe drought in these years. We also wanted to look at the link between root traits and um, uh, stay green. Uh, so a lot of um, inspiration comes, comes from the work that has been done by our researchers here at UQ on sorghum. Um, and uh, the way they uh, define a uh, stay green trait is um, the length of, um, of um, grain, grain filling period from flowering time all the way to senescence. And, and this, this trait is really complex. Uh, it could be a consequence of uh, plants using uh, less water early on um, uh, during um, um, uh, early stages of plant development and shifting that use to later on when uh, after flowering, postanthesis, when using water is really critical um, for the plants. Um, the, the, uh, alternatively, uh, it could be uh, a, um, a mechanism where, uh, where, where plants have better, better uh, access to water in the soil profile um, by having uh, an improved root system architecture. 
So th this is how they define root uh, uh, stain green. Um, but in, in, in bread wheat, uh, Karine and Jack has done a really uh, um, great job modeling the, the senescence rate um, by fitting this, um, this curve uh, from flowering time all the way to uh, uh, full maturity and um, uh, extracting a lot of parameters uh, as, uh, associated or linked to stay green, uh, like the area under the curve, uh, for example, which is the length of grain filling period that I mentioned. So in our research uh, from, uh, for Durham, uh, we, uh, we wanted to investigate those um, stay green traits. And uh, what we did, uh, we looked at, um, uh, we measured flowering time and, um, and NDVI measurements uh, uh, from flowering time all the way to senescence uh, in, in our trials in, in Warwick. And when we looked at the correlations between stay green traits uh, that we measured in, in these trials and, uh, and yield, we found a reasonably good correlation, as you can see here. Um, and uh, um, th this is really nice that, um, that there is a really good link between stay green traits and these water use mechanisms and uh, yield. So um, th then we had a look at um, our root angle QTL uh, and try to understand the, the link between that and stay green. Uh, we looked at the individuals that carried have one for our uh, uh, root angle QTL and compared it to the individuals that have HAP2 or haplotype 2 uh, or the alternate allele. And we found that there was a significant difference between uh, uh, those two groups. Uh, and when we looked at the yield, uh, it was really significant. So um, this was really uh, great to see. We also looked at the link between root biomass and uh, stay green traits and yield. So we, we found that the, the HAP1 for uh, root biomass uh, QTL was um, uh, associated with, um, uh, with, higher, uh, with higher stay green when we compared the individuals that had um, high root biomass uh, in comparison to the ones lacked it. And um, we can see that that was reflecting a lot on, uh, on yield performance. The most ex exciting um, um, results were like when we when we looked at really closely in uh, linked individuals uh, that um, uh, that were segregating for both the QTLs root angle and root biomass QTL and compared it to the lines that they didn't have these two QTLs uh, with, within these uh, populations we we um, we found that and in in the low yielding environments there was a really significant difference. Uh, but when we looked at um, um, the high yielding environments, we, we could see a similar trend, uh, but, but um, it was really exciting to see no penalties, uh, which is really uh, great news. While there was a really nice link between roots and yield, uh, the variation for, for yield performance was, um, was not always explained by roots. And so here is just an, an example of um, two genotypes that, um, that were from the same family. So family three of, uh, of uh, the Durham Nam population. And um, they had similar days to flowering, uh, same root system architecture, but they really differed for the, this synthesis curve. And um, uh, you can see uh, this genotype um, is um, is really crashing really early on, while this one stays greener for a longer period uh, and uh, keep, keeps filling these grains, uh, which resulted in, um, in higher yield. So this, uh, this made us really think what's going on there. It's, it, it mustn't be just roots contributing to yield. And we know yield is really complex. We started to think about what's going, uh, going on in, in the above ground, in the shoots. So, he did, so this one, the, the, this brings us to this question, can we dissect the relationships between root and shoot components that influence yield? So we've got, we really got to start look um, at, um, have a closer look at the shoot, shoot component and provide a full picture about how these uh, are, uh, are contributing to yield. And um, perhaps using the phenomics uh, technology, 
um, we, which really uh, assisting us to, to, to do this, we, we might be able to uh, better dissect those canopy traits. And um, um, this year uh, we have our uh, experiment uh, and we teamed up uh, with, with a lot of cro coffee crop researchers um, to uh, integrate crop modeling into our experiments with Karin Chino um, and UAV phenotyping with David Jordan and Andreas Bodgea. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, crop physiology uh, with Andy and Barbara George. So with, with UAV, it's really a great thing. The great thing about this UAV phenotyping is that uh, this technology has the capacity and opportunity for, um, for showing us things that we can't visualize and see it with, with our own eyes. Things like uh, canopy temperature, uh, for example, that, that could be indicative to uh, successful root systems. And through this detailed knowledge, we are planning to piece together above and below ground um, uh, and better understand the dynamics and how those traits contribute to increased yield. So this, uh, this is um, a couple of examples that um, uh, I, I, the, the example that I would like to show you uh, from our uh, yield trial this year, uh, just to show you the differences in uh, and variation in, in above ground traits um, in, in the field. Uh, here are the genotype, uh, genotype one and two. And when we looked at their development and um, early for early vigor and canopy cover, we can see um, uh, th this genotype takes off really fast in comparison to, to this genotype. And that could be actually uh, one of the mechanisms that plant use uh, for saving water early on, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a mechanism of, of uh, stay green, and then being able to use it later on when uh, water use is really critical. We also teamed up with the researchers in Wageningen, uh, Daniela, and, and this is part of the PhD student, uh, Yichen uh, Kang. Uh, she just uh, came on board and then they've been doing really some um, uh, nice work looking at the rate of canopy development uh, using all of our NDVI data uh, for early vigor by uh, and what they've been doing they um, they fitting this um, um, spline models uh, where, where they're really flexible and uh, they we can extract a lot of information from this um, for example uh, the mean rate of uh, NDVI and the area under the curve and all these traits could be um, uh, mapped and looked at uh, in more details. At the same time, we have been uh, looking at other canopy development traits. Uh, and one of the traits that we've been looking and interested in is uh, we've been tracking the number of tillers for, for certain plants. And so uh, what, what we used to, what we've seen so far from our experience and from our research, um, is a strong association between above and below ground traits. Uh, so, um, the, for example, um, the, the wide root angle uh, genotypes, they usually have uh, two to three tillers um, more than the narrow root angle. Um, and that's what we've been seeing um, uh, uh, this strong link. But um, while seeing all of this, um, we've seen genotypes that they actually do the exact opposite. And uh, what we see is like a narrow genotype uh, carries uh, or, or has much uh, more different um, above ground uh, canopy uh, development. And, and so this is, while this is not really common, but, but in plant breeding, this is what we actually after. And we look, at, look for these rare combinations that could be exploited in plant breeding to come up with different combinations um, that suit different environments. So to take this to the next level, um, uh, can we modify root systems uh, of elite varieties without modifying the shoot? And, and this question is really um, a part of um, a, 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 a rooty project that is uh, funded by GRDC. And what we're trying to do in this project is to develop elite lines that have uh, very similar phenology and above ground traits and uh, differ uh, below ground that have different uh, root characteristics that could be uh, and root configurations that could be actually tested under different environment types and uh, soils.
to, de to develop these elite lines, um, Charlotte Rambler, uh, she's a PhD student, and she's done a great job combining two methods of, of screening, um, of phenotyping, um, um, seminal roots and uh, root biomass, combining it with micro seed selection using the markers that um, cast markers we developed. Uh, so she starts screening um, uh, seminal roots, the narrow and wide, uh, high and low root biomass. She runs the markers and select further selects. Uh, and um, uh, those highly selected individuals, they get back cross to the recurrent parent. And she, she's done this um, a cycle of, of, of selection a uh, few times. And here is just to, to show you uh, the, the, the selection that she's done uh, on, uh, or phenotypic selection she's done on uh, uh, root angle for uh, braid wheat. The, the problem here was um, we didn't really have um, a good, a good um, uh, cast marker for, uh, for root angle because um, uh, root angle in braid wheat is controlled by multiple genes with minor effects. So it was really hard to develop a marker for that. Um, although we were lucky, we found three other markers and we developed three cast markers for, for other traits. But uh, Charlotte uh, um, uh, wanted to use phenotypic selection and uh, perhaps um, use the tails um, after doing the back crossing, selecting for narrow angle and wide angle um, and uh, in, the, in the BC2F2. And in the next generation, in the BC2F3 porogeny, uh, here you can see really a good result. Um, we can see that we developed uh, elite lines uh, in the background of uh, Bolog as a recurrent parent, but really narrow and wide lines in all these four, back, uh, four backgrounds. So phenotypic selection really worked. So from, from, uh, from this pipeline, um, we selected 120 genotypes per background, uh, uh, and we uh, took those lines to the field. And this year, they are growing now in, uh, in Gatton. Um, and um, while they're growing there, Charlotte took the opportunity and um, started measuring some above ground traits like flowering time, uh, plant height, spike length. Uh, so, to, to have some control on her uh, selection. So what she did after that, she further selected individuals um, from these 120 genotypes. She, she selected 20 um, genotypes uh, or elite lines that have uh, very similar bolog background um, and, uh, and differ below ground. So uh, we, we had um, uh, different root configurations, but similar above ground traits. For, for all our um, um, uh, backgrounds. And here is just um, uh, another um, uh, example of the Bolog, just to show you the, um, the 20 lines that Charlotte has selected. Uh, here is Bolog, the recurrent parent. And here, here are the donor lines. And as we can see here, those genotypes um, have a similar root angle to the recurrent parent, but we have recovered a lot of uh, root biomass from this donor line. Uh, which is really great to, to see. And also this, uh, these donor lines, we've recovered um, um, higher and narrower root angle from, from this donor line, uh, which uh, those lines, those progenies have very similar above ground uh, bolo, but differ or below ground, as you can see. Uh, these two, two lines are really interesting uh, because we can see the donor, uh, donor line uh, here and uh, bolo have very similar root angle but those two lines are showing uh, transgressive segregation and have outperformed both their, both their parents. So um, after developing this really valuable material with, we, we, uh, with modified root system architecture, now uh, as part of the Rudy project funded by GRDC, uh, we, we want to test their performance in the field. Uh, and, and as part of this uh, um, IWIP network, uh, we can uh, we can send this seed and ship it overseas and test it for yield. Uh, but but uh, we, we are really fortunate um, to team up with a team uh, with a, um, a group in Ulich. Um, and um, what we are going to to, to do is um, uh, we will use this rapid mobile um, root coring in the field while they're growing for yield testing, and actually validate this uh, this root distribution changes. Um, uh, and and uh, they contribute and link that with the yield at the same time. 
So this is really exciting um, for us to do it. I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the results. This brings me to, to the challenges and uh, future vision. So uh, uh, root shoot um, uh, dynamics. So we really need to understand how these root and shoot traits are interacting with each other. And uh, we need to better understand how we could dissect the complexity uh, of canopy traits and, and the role that they play in improving yield. Um, and I believe this is uh, uh, where, where the future research could be um, and um, invested in. Uh, phenomics technologies are key to understanding the complex canopy traits uh, and they, they can be really combined with, the, with other modeling to better understand and unravel the complexity around canopy and uh, better explain yield. Um, the, the biggest challenge for all of us here now after doing all this work is um, um, how do we integrate selection for root traits uh, into breeding programs to develop our future varieties. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all our um, collaborators and um, uh, my supervisors, uh, mentors during my PhD and now during my postdoc. Um, also, I would like to um, uh, th thank the funding bodies, uh, uh, GRDC and uh, IWIP, uh, also the international um, the, the, uh, uh, MBBISB, which is the Monsanto Mitchell Bolog International Scholarship that funded my uh, PhD. Um, and um, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Samir. Um, now it's time to open the Q&A session. And, and there's a few questions uh, coming in. So we'll, we've got a few questions for you, Samir. Um, uh, to, there's one question here. Um, is, is root angle correlated with tiller numbers? Yeah, well, um, so far what we've seen, um, as I mentioned, the, um, the, there is a high, a high link uh, between uh, root angle and tiller number. And what we've seen is the wider root angle is actually uh, linked to uh, more tillers above ground and narrower root angle with less, uh, uh, less number of tillers. Okay, um, thanks Samir. Uh, and what about the correlation between, you know, your root traits measured in the glasshouse environment? You know, yeah. it's not the field, it's an artificial environment. How does that translate or what's the correlation like to the field? Yeah, well, what we did, uh, we wanted to do a, a validation after we did the, um, uh, so we, we did two experiments. Well, the first one was um, a seedling uh, stage um, in the glass house and we looked at uh, shovelomics, but we also did um, an intermediate experiment where we had um, uh, boxes or uh, chambers uh, to look at more mature roots. And we found really um, a good correlation between uh, those and uh, our results for durum wheat um, uh, were, were actually um, uh, similar to the results that have been reported by uh, Roberto's group in Bologna. Uh, so yeah, um, a correlation about um, bet anywhere between um, point, uh, point 0.6 and point 0.8. Okay, um, did you You've looked at root angle and root biomass as some of the key traits so far in your research. What are there any other root traits uh, that could be of interest or value? Do you think that's a really good uh, good question, uh, Lee? Uh, the, the we know that uh, root angle and root um, uh, root biomass are uh, great traits to look at um, uh, for to know the distribution uh, of roots at different layers. But, but, but really, there are some really important traits. For, for example, uh, root hairs. Um, we, we are collaborating now with, uh, with a group um, in Thailand. Um, we have a student where, where they are going to have a closer look and uh, quantify these important traits, especially they've, they've seen that there is a lot of interaction between root hair and um, the nutrient uptake and also moisture. So, uh, this is an area that could be um, 
uh, further looked at and uh, we are um, in progress. Well, you, it seems your, your seminar, Samir, has really sparked some interest um, in terms of the connection with the above ground components, in particular tillering. Um, there's uh, some more questions coming in on that topic. Um, particularly, uh, some members of the audience, they want to they wanna know, um, is the link between root angle with fertile tillers or, or non-fertile tillers? Um, have you looked at this? Yeah, well, the, this is a really uh, good question, Lee, because um, uh, if you've seen those, um, the, the comparison between the lines, you can see uh, at flowering time, the, the fertile, uh, the, the number of tillers dropped. And uh, that is because few tillers um, die. Um, and um, well, we are, this year, it's, uh, we, we're doing a lot of work and uh, we would like to uh, look further um, uh, towards the end of the season and count all the tillers and, and also count um, uh, the, the tillers that uh, made it to the end, not just flowering. Uh, we, we might look at uh, if they filled that grain or not. So we, we will dissect this trait better. Well, it sounds like you're, uh, hopefully you can start to answer that question at the end yeah. of the season. Um, uh, there's a question here from Erin. Um, do you see differences in root and tiller traits and their relationship change with management practices, especially, for example, planting density? Do you see the dynamics change in, in this situation? I think um, uh, th this is a great uh, question from Erin. Uh, and and um, the, there is a lot of potential um, com combining uh, those traits with management. And so uh, for future, I'm, I'm, I'm just hopeful that one day we, uh, we could uh, look at uh, quantifying or comparing those um, different root configurations. Like for example, having narrower root angle and more density of plants as a management practice, uh, how much that will be in terms of uh, uh, yield for farmers uh, benefit. And uh, th this, these questions um, could be investigated. We, we actually haven't looked at that, but this is a really interesting question. Mm, some, some good opportunities for future yeah. research, I'm sure. Um, there is a question here um, uh, about root length. Uh, have you measured root length on these materials? And have you identified lines with high and low root length? We haven't done this work actually, um, but um, we're, this year we are also in the process of um, doing more experiments uh, and also not only the length, but also look at um, the rate of uh, root growth. Uh, we might monitor how fast um, the roots grow at different um, plant growth stages. Uh, and that, that could be really interesting to link it with, um, uh, with our stay green traits later on. Um, a question here about stay green. Uh, do you see differences in uh, protein content in the grain for lines that have differences in stay green? That is a really nice question, especially uh, for durum wheat, because durum is a quality product. And uh, uh, most of our durum uh, turns into uh, pasta in, uh, in Italian uh, millers. Uh, so it's, it's a very good question. Um, well, I personally haven't looked at that and I haven't gone uh, towards quality, uh, but, but yeah, th this could be looked at um, uh, by uh, just looking at some of the really good proxies like NIR, for example, uh, run it, running it through the machine and getting some uh, um, data that could be linked uh, with its day green. It's, it's really a good question. We, we might actually look at that this year. Yeah, you think there could be some pretty important um, relationships there, particularly yeah. because we know, you know, that the impact of drought affects grain quality quite yeah. severely. Yep. Um, another question uh, from Raju uh, is the plasticity of the roots. Um, uh, in the root angle trait, uh, do you see any plasticity or how much plasticity is involved in terms of nitrogen fertilization or irrigation? Do you see changes? Uh, well, um... Uh, we, in terms of, um, so it's just to get this question right, um, the interaction between uh, nitrogen and, um, uh, and roots or uh, in terms of angle, plasticity? Um, I, I, I think he's referring specifically, or he or she's referring specifically to uh, root angle uh, and, uh, and about how plastic the trait is in terms yeah. of 
interaction with the environmental factors. It could be even temperature too, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, it is actually. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of plasticity in terms of results. Um, uh, temperature is a big factor um, uh, affecting uh, root angle. Uh, for example, when we run our experiments, we have uh, we have to normalize and, and have uh, similar uh, temperatures when we test so that we can uh, see, um, uh, hopefully see similar angles. But there is a lot of interaction with soil as well and with fertilizers, I'm sure. Um, there is a lot of um, work that um, uh, Mike Bell and uh, Frederick have been involved in, uh, looking at some of our durum lines and uh, trying to um, better understand combining those root traits uh, with, with uh, phosphorus uh, use efficiency uh, and, and the farmer's practices. So trying to bring all of this together in, uh, in another GRDC project, actually. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question um, uh, about uh, root, root effects uh, on height. Have you seen or observed any trends where uh, root length or root angle characteristics are associated with plant height? Well, um, there is there is an association between plant high and roots. So having better access to water, you um, when where, when researchers do their trials uh, next to each other, one is irrigated, one is not. Um, the one is irrigated and have access to water, it goes slightly taller. So when you see um, uh, roots that have better access to water in the soil profile. They tend to grow a little bit more than than uh, the other ones, so th there is correlation. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, Samir. Um, uh, can you try to explain why you think the wide root angle uh, haplotype uh, is giving uh, you better performance? Um, yeah, th that's a really good question, uh, Lee. Um, uh, when we saw this result, we were um, surprised. Actually, we, we were thinking that um, why not the narrow? Um, but but apparently, the the wide root angle has um, more capacity of growing um, um, roots in between the, the outer um, uh, root angle, and um, we we well, we would like to see. Um, uh, more results to support this. And this year we're trying to better understand these dynamics. Uh, that's what we found in our uh, experiments. Um, hopefully we can explain this um, a bit better by looking at the shoot components as well and how those uh, um, above and below ground traits interact with each other. Uh, yep, it's, it's certainly not straightforward and, and pretty tough doing uh, field trial work in, in a season like this year as well. Um, uh, I have a question here about uh, root angle. Uh, is it a trait that's specific to cereals or do you, is this trait also important in legumes for drought adaptation? I think, you know? um, yeah, I think this, this trait is really important for um, uh, all the crops that don't get flooded um, by water. For example, uh, cotton or uh, um, uh, rice or uh, even rice, if, if it's grown in um, uh, not in flood, uh, it could be an advantageous uh, trait. So we uh, we have um, um, all sort of um, uh, all sort of crops that that will rely heavily, and they, most of them grown in really marginal areas, like um, where where there is very limited water. So having um, optimized root systems uh, could could really benefit the crops. Okay. Um... Um, I think that's about it for the questions. We might uh, leave it there and want to thank you again, Samir, for a, a really good seminar. And uh, I'm sure if people have more questions, they could, they could reach out and uh, click you an email. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.